good to be able to cite the scriptures with people who distort it. Okay? Anyway, um, we are talking about the fall. Okay? Okay, before we discuss the poems, I'll give you a, a little sheet here with uh, a little. Okay. That sheet has a, um, it's a little comparison. Okay, we went through the seven capital sins, deadly sins they're called. Why are they called capital sins? Deadly, deadly capital, the same thing. What's capital punishment? It means yeah. punishment, you get the death penalty. Capital sins um, are deadly sins in the sense that they, um, they kill the life of God in the soul, which is called sanctifying grace, a term which you better know for a test tomorrow. Okay? Sanctifying grace is our share of God's life. Okay? Um, the first question here, this is from a little catechism okay, for children, and, uh, but it's, it's good for adults too. And this has the seven capital sins or vices, and there are contrary virtues because we have to, we have an inclination to rebel against God in these seven ways. God gives us His grace, and with the grace, we're supposed to practice the virtues that counter the capital or deadly sins. Pride is, is the root of all sin. Okay. What is it that counters pride? Humility. Humility is an acknowledgement that um, of really who we are in relationship to God. That's what humility is. It's, um, it is a recognition that we are creatures, we're totally dependent upon God for everything, and any gifts and talents we have, it's not supposed to glorify us, it's supposed to glorify God. So if God gives us gifts and talents, it's all to glorify Him, all for His greater glory. But our inclination is to want to be in the spotlight and have the light shine on us and everyone think we're wonderful and for our good looks or our sports ability or our intelligence or whatever it may be. Okay. So, um, like I was quoting you yesterday, that line from uh, Carly Simon's song, You're So Vain, I couldn't remember it. Okay. He, as you walked into the room, you. You're, you strategically placed your hat, and with one eye, mm -hmm. you watched yourself in the mirror go by. Okay, so he's he's watching himself go by in the mirror, and looking at all the women looking at him as he's looking in the mirror. You know, it's like I look in the mirror. I hope everyone's looking at me. That's that's vanity. That's a form of pride. Okay. Um, so humility counters pride. What did Jesus say? Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Um, Meekness is another one. Actually, we go down to four since we talked about meekness. Anger, sinful anger, is uncontrolled anger, unreasonable anger. Anger is not in itself a sin. It's, it's sinful when it's uncontrolled, when it goes beyond the bounds of reason and we, we lose control over, over our anger. Um, well, we're supposed to counter anger, as Jesus did, with meekness. Meekness oftentimes is misunderstood. People think that meekness means weakness. It doesn't mean weakness. Jesus was meek. He wasn't weak. He was strong. Uh, meekness means gentleness. To respond to an insult or an injury with gentleness instead of, instead of anger and, and violence. And what does Jesus tell us? If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. It's not an easy thing to do. I don't know about you, but if someone strikes me, hits me, I feel like snapping them back. That's a natural response. Jesus wants us to respond in a supernatural way, like he did. He let himself be crucified. Um, so meekness, gentleness, in response to, to counter anger, you have to cultivate that and, and try to be meek, try to be gentle when people mistreat us. Okay? Uh, 
Anger comes from a real or perceived injury, either to ourselves or to others. And uh, usually we get most anger, angry when the anger, when the injustice is toward ourselves. You can't hold out of anger. You gotta let it go. It's like a rusty nail in you. you. Gotta pull it out, forget about it. That's why confession is good. You can confess anger. I have this anger, I can't forgive someone. I, that's a sin if you don't forgive. And who tells us we have to forgive if we expect forgiveness? Jesus. The Our Father prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus says, if you do not forgive others for what they do, you, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you for what you've done. So we can't expect to get forgiveness and not forgive. But forgiveness is difficult sometimes. Our anger, our our Wounded pride is an obstacle to it. Go to number two, covetousness or greed. How do you overcome that? Liberality. You'd be generous. Okay? You, get, you get gifts, you get money, you, you share it with those in need. Um, and here I'll talk about something, the biblical concepts. Okay? I first read it. I never read it. I never read it or heard about it when I was growing up. I don't know if I missed it or the nuns that taught me never talked about it, but uh, I never heard of the practice of tithing. Any of you know what tithing is? Yeah, giving 10% of you. Giving 10%, tithing, you give 10% back to God. Yeah. It's the Old Testament uh, exhorts us to tithe. You give 10% of, of what you earn back to God. You can give it to your own church. Maybe the, the Catholic practices are recommended is give 5% to your parish or your church that you go to, and 5% to charity. You uh, Right off the top, you give back 10% to God what you have made, what you have earned. And uh, you don't wait until the end of the month and say, well, I have a few pennies left, so I'll I'll give that right. to share with you, okay, because then you're, you're not being generous. Uh, if we tithe, it's, it's, it helps us to be generous. When I started working, that's when I read it. I was reading the Bible, and I thought, tithing is tithing. Well, this, this is interesting, you know. I'd never heard of it before. So I started tithing. If you tithe, then you're, you're, you detach yourself from all this, from the money that you're making, in a sense. Okay? This is actually... Everything belongs to God, right? Yeah. Everything we own, the shirt on our backs, any money we make, it's all God's. It's all God's gift. When we're tithing, we're giving back to God a percentage of what is God's already, and especially um, helping this, this you know, generosity that we show will, will help uh, the church, will help others, help the poor, um, those who are really in need. So we want to be liberal and generous with the goods we have, not hoard our money. Jesus tells some parables. For example, the rich man and Lazarus. Ever heard of that? Yeah. Why did the rich man end up in hell? Because he never, even though he wasn't really moving directly to Lazarus, he never like, gave, like never gave him anything. Never gave him anything. The, do he, the dogs ate the food off the rich man's table that fell to the floor, but Lazarus is sitting out by the gate, starving. And um, so they both die. The rich man ends up in hell. And Jesus says, you know, the separation of the sheep and the goats, depart from me into the everlasting flames. I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. So on and so forth. Not because someone did something bad, but it's that we didn't do something good. And if we have money, we should be sharing with people, especially um, you know, a lot of money. Oftentimes, it's harder for the rich to give away their money, to be generous with it. <clears throat> or they like to blow a horn. You know? Oh, I gave so much money to a charity. Well, you do it. Silently, God sees what you do. Okay? So, liberality, generosity, counters greed, covetousness. Okay? 
Now lust, we practice chastity. Chastity is using our sexual powers according to God's plan, depending upon our state in life. And there are three states in life. Have you heard this before? Three states in life. You're in one state of life, I'm in another state of life, and your parents are in the third state of life. Single, there's celibate or consecrated virginity if you're a nun, and then married. So if, if you are like me, you forsake use of your sexual powers, which I had a right to use to get married and have children for the sake of the kingdom. If people are married, well, then they use their sexual powers within marriage. That means you can't be having sex with someone, not your spouse, because what is that called? Adultery, Adultery yeah. So, and, uh, and thirdly, if you're single, we refrain from uh, out of respect for our bodies and the bodies of others, of using our, our sexual powers, our reproductive powers, until we until you're either in a, in a priestly or consecrated state or married state. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> and purity, wanting to keep our eyes pure, not look on things, uh, modesty, dressing modestly, talking modestly, I mean, all these things help to counter lust, okay, which is the inclination to um, use our sexual powers not in keeping with God's plan, just for the pleasure or fun of it. Okay? So we go to gluttony, temperance, or, or moderation is, is the virtue we have to cultivate to temper our desire for food and drink. Okay? It's good. Uh, I always recommend every day refuse yourself something in food or drink, at least one thing. Drink, snack, something. Say no to something. Helps discipline our will. Make it make it a spiritual offering. And offer this up to you, Jesus. Okay, I won't have uh, an extra, you know, uh, donuts or um, or or a, a dessert tonight or or whatever it may be. You say no to something. It helps strengthen our willpower. And actually, um, that's that's the idea of of. Maybe abstaining from something, I mean, you abstain from something, or you can fast. Um, I recommend to, to people that on Fridays you do a Lenten fast. A Lenten fast is having one full meal only, the two other smaller meals combined don't equal the main meal, and no eating between meals. I recommend to do it every Friday. Every Friday we're supposed to do some form of penance. Did you know that? Because it's the day Christ died. When I was growing up, when I was young, the form of penance that was required was abstaining from meat. We had to eat. That's why everyone ate fish. And, um, but the, after the Second Vatican Council, the Church says you don't have to do that. That's not a requirement. But the, the teaching is still there that we're supposed to make some, do some some type of abstaining or, or, um, or fasting. And if you do a Lenten fast on Fridays, it's good. It helps to strengthen our willpower to say no to sin in other places, especially the sin of lust. If you can say no to, to what's lawful for us in food or drink, it helps to discipline our wills, which can be weak in regard to the inclination to, to, uh, to lust. Okay. So, that's gluttony and temperance. And envy, for envious of people, well, we, we practice brotherly love. We, we, we don't want to be uh, envious of others, what they have. We should rejoice in the gifts that other have, others have. And love them. God gave you, you know, gift of good looks or sporting ability or whatever it may be, intelligence, okay? Praise God. You're my brother or sister in Christ, I love you for that. Okay. And sloth, laziness, um, we overcome that by diligence. We be diligent. We can form ourselves in these virtues. You just like, uh, A virtue is, is a good habit that you keep doing it over and over until it becomes second nature. So um, if someone's maybe more naturally sloth or slothful than others, 
you can just really try to practice be diligent. You know, I'm going to do my work on time and get things done and, and counter that, that uh, inclination to slow. So, um, anyway, those, the other things on here are, are not necessary for us now. But 325, that question, why are they called capital sins? Because they are the sources from which all other sins take their rise. Okay? It's, they're like the doorways to other sins. Pride, covetousness, lust, anger, gluttony. Replace these G, you could renumber them. Okay? Pride, lust, anger, covetousness, envy, slow gluttony. Replace this G is an easy way to remember it. To know ourselves is, is very beneficial and helpful. Okay? Now, um, I gave out yesterday a, um, a poem <clears throat> called The Hound of Heaven. And uh, it's written by Francis Thompson. I think, I think it was written over 100 years ago. Francis Thompson was, uh, he was a sinner. He, I think he studied dentistry or something, and he became addicted to cocaine. And um, he, he lived down the streets for many years. He went back and forth with um, struggling between trying to be good and falling into various sins. And um, um, Hound of Heaven is, um, is kind of his personal story. Who is the hound of heaven? Jesus. God. God. Jesus is the hound. Okay. What does it mean? He's a hound. He followed after the people because he loved them. Yeah. He's, he's going to go after the lost sheep. Okay. Jesus is the good shepherd. The sheep is lost. He's going to go after them. Or like a hound will will keep hounding you to go after. You know, ever, ever see a hound dog? Anyone ever see a hound dog? Okay. Yeah, they're kind of neat. You know, they, they bark and they'll you let them go and they'll they'll chase you know a raccoon or whatever you want and they'll they'll keep pounding them, you know, trailing them until they, they trap them. Well God is is the one who keeps following us, okay? And uh, he wants us to return to him if we sin. So uh, Francis Thompson begins the poem by talking about how he was fleeing God by his immoral life. Okay. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him and under, under running laughter. Up this day, hopes I sped and shot precipitated adown, adown titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. He's trying to run from God. God is chasing him. Right? But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat. And a voice beat, capital B, okay? the word of God, in other words, okay? more instant than the feet, all things betray thee who betrayest me. In other words, don't be fooled by the bells and whistles, all the all the pleasures that earth offers, because um, these things, if they betray me, they will betray you. And um, well, I won't go through the whole poem, but um, if you if you look, um, let me see. If you look at the left-hand column, four lines from the bottom, okay? Some people try to find pleasure and their ultimate meaning in nature. As if nature, the world, creation, is going to satisfy our longings. And he says here, nature, poor stepdame, cannot slake my drought. Let her if she would owe me, drop yon blue bosom veil of sky and show me the breaths of her tenderness. 
Never did any milk of hers once bless my thirsty mouth. Nigh and nigh draws the chase with unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, and past those noised feet, a voice comes yet more fleet, lo, naught contents thee who contentest not me. So our hearts are, are have a capacity for the infinite, for God, and only God can fill it. The things of nature are never going to satisfy us. This is why, why do people, the rich and the famous, end up committing suicide? They have wealth, fame, popularity, and they're miserable because they think that their wealth and fame and popularity can satisfy them, and it can't. And that's what Francis Thompson is explaining here. Um, and um, let's see. Um, if you look down in the middle column, he's talking about the, the second big stanza there, naked I wait thy love's uplift, uplifted stroke my harness piece by piece thou hast hewn from me and smitten to my knee. I am defenseless utterly. I slept, methinks, and woke, and slowly gazing as if from a fog of sleep, uh, find me stripped in sleep. In the rash, lusty head of my young powers, so he's, he's talking about as a young man, okay? In the, I shook the pillaring hours and pulled my life upon me, grimed with smears. I stand amid the dust of the mounded years. My mangled youth lies dead beneath the heap. My days have crackled and gone up in smoke, have puffed and burst as sun starts on a stream. Yea, faileth now even dream, the dreamer and the loop, the lupness, even the linked fantasies, in whose blossomy twist I swung the earth, a trinket at my wrist, are yielding hordes of all too weak account for earth and heaven Reefs so overproduced. Ah, is thy love indeed a weed, albeit an amaranthine weed, suffering no flowers except its own to mount? Ah, must designer infinite, ah, must thou char the wood and air and slime with him? Well, he goes on to talk about how um, as a youth he, he had all these pleasures and they left him dry and empty. Okay? And the end of the poem. Wait, wait. End of the poem. Read the last paragraph here. Whom wilt thou find to love? This is God speaking to, to Francis. Okay. Whom wilt thou find to love a noble thee, save me, save only me? All which I took from thee, I did but take, not for thy harms, but just that thou mightest seek it in my arms. All of which thy child's mistake fancies is lost, I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand and come. Halts by me that footfall is my gloom after all, shade of his hand outstretched on his car caressingly. Ah, findest, ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou dravest love from me who dravest me. So, Great poem, Francis Thompson. Tomorrow test. On the Trinity, okay, on angels, and on the human person, the fall as well, okay? And the effects of the fall. So, um, know the seven deadly sins, be able to. List them and enunciate.